Hello, I'm Julie Swenson, Managing Director of Forward Theatre Company in Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm Mike Fisher, Milwaukee-based theatre writer and dramaturg. I'm Jen Apoff gray Founder and Artistic Director of Forward Theatre Company. And this is Theatre Forward, a twice-monthly conversation about theatre from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theatre in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 50 of Theater Yay! Forward. Yay! We thought we would spend this episode on the topic of where do we go from here? Talking about what we see for our company and our industry as we look at the months and years ahead, especially as we've all been kind of knocked off our path by COVID. Um, so we'll, we'll meander our way through a couple of different topics uh, related to that question. But I thought maybe we could start with one of the biggest questions that we've been asked by our patrons over these last six months or so, which is where do we think um, streaming and virtual theater um, are going to go as a part of our industry? I mean, this is a this is a new, really pretty new th development for theater. And how do we think that that may continue to be a part of our lives going forward? It's a big question. It's a big question. I think, can I jump in and Please. say, that it will be um, interesting to see what happens between Actors' Equity and SAG. We've already talked about that in a podcast. Um, kind of all bets are off right now. Do what you need to do to stay alive. And God bless them, the union said, go. Um, I will be very curious when we can indeed have people in an audience who, who then handles those streaming rights. How does that work? Are we able to do it? I sincerely hope that we will be able to do some aspect of it. Because one of the very best things that happened in this crazy year is that Forward Theater was able to um, show our work to people around the country. And we have we have people that have bought tickets living all over, all over this wonderful. Uh, United States, and I don't want to lose them. That would really break my heart if uh, we couldn't give them something. Um, what that looks like, how that looks, I don't know, but um, I would like to spend some time, um, you know, with staff and, and AC and things like that to figure out how we can still accommodate those people. I'm really glad you brought up the union issue, Julie, just because I think one of the things I, I found myself having to um, explain or, or describe for, for a lot of folks who are enjoying virtual theater and streaming as part of their lives now is that it's not just a decision that we can make. Yes, we want to continue to do this after we're back in person. Um, and it's not just whether the unions want to allow theaters to record and distribute. It's also the authors and the licensing houses. And that's a really big deal because those streaming rights are not a typical thing. And um, I really am curious to see whether playwrights and their representation will think that this is good for them or if they think that it in some ways impedes their um, their work and their income and, and their control over their work. Um, so I really don't, I really think it's too soon to tell the degree to which we will be allowed to do streams of our, of our regular productions. I have to say the thing that I feel quite strongly will be a big part of the future and is less tangled up in those, um, those union and licensing concerns is new play development because, you know, We've discovered, especially through our Wisconsin rights uh, efforts last summer um, and, and what some other companies we've seen have done, this is a really um, pretty easy and very cost effective way to work on the development of a new play because you can get a bunch of actors together and a director and a dramaturg and, and whoever else you need into a virtual room and you can read the play out loud and you can hear how it's working. It's not the same as, as to having a reading in front of a live audience. And that is still going to be a crucial part of any play's development, but you can get a lot done and a lot worked on in this format. And it just doesn't have remote. I mean, obviously paying for the time of all the artists involved, but you're not now renting a space and people are traveling and um, you can, I think that's going to be a huge tool in our toolkit 
for, um, for new play development. And that, that feels really exciting to me. And the, the ability to have a playwright who may not be, uh, in the same neck of the woods as you are, who can really participate, uh, in that way. So that excites me. The, the whole debate in a way reminds me of, um, to, to, to go to the, the only sport I actually know anything about, which is baseball, but the debates that came on, that, that came when television entered the picture and baseball owners for the longest time resisted the idea of putting baseball on TV. Uh, they thought it was going to hurt the game. They thought it was going to lower attendance and they were completely and totally wrong. And once they figured that out, they saw that this was a potential leverage for increasing interest in the game. People now know what forward theater is all about. Um, who never had heard of forward theater to Julie's point. People have seen the fabulous actors that everybody in Wisconsin knows at American players theater all over the world. I'm going to get off this podcast and watch the six hours of the national theater just dropped this week, angels in America. Um, that is that is now newly available and which is a terrific production. If we care about access and democracy and bringing more people into the fold, then we need to do things like this. There are people all over rural America who don't have the money or the time or ability to get to New York or London or, or Chicago who are now being given a chance to see these plays. There are people who, um, for different physical reasons, um, in terms of age or uh, or, or otherwise are not able to get to the theater that now are, are able to see things. And, and that to, to, to not make our future one which includes those people is just wrong. Um, and I do think that, that the unions will figure this out because they will have to. You cannot put this toothpaste back in the tube. Well, well and to your point, oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say licensing companies, think of their, their paradigm is that you get a license and then they they literally do a string around the town how many miles away you are from the next person that has that same license. That's how it's been done for years and years and years. Now there is no string. There's no radius. Um, and uh, so I'm hoping that as, as we have morphed into um, different ways to show theater, that, that there are there are unions, there are licensing companies that need to do this. Yeah. Well, and to your point uh, earlier, Mike, about accessibility, one of the, the really exciting and cool um, things that we've been able to do, like our most recent production of the niceties that was um, uh, a, a digital streaming production that just closed, we were able to close caption that. Yeah. Which you know, we, we don't typically in the theater do, uh, you know, opera super titles, um, that, that would be, uh, helpful for the audience. Uh, and this was a, a great, uh, a great accessibility step that was really pretty easy, pretty cost effective for us to do. Um, and so th those kinds of things, I, I, I like your metaphor, the toothpaste is out of the tube. Um, but the question is whether all of the people who, um, who need to be a part of envisioning this next wave, whether they're really going to come to the table or not. Um, yeah. I, should, I mean, regardless of how the particulars of who gets to see things go, I think that the work that's being done and God knows um, Jen Gray and Scott Hayden dealing with our putting out the season that we've had this year. Uh, and Julia, in terms of production, you guys know better than I do, not only how hard it is, but the new opportunities um, that, that are, that have been made available. I saw a, a Strindberg short at the alley theater the other day, uh, the stronger, which is two women, one of whom is talking the entire time with the other whom is silent. And when you see that in the theater, I've only seen it once in the theater, but unless you are like in the second row, you can't register the, the what's going on on the face of the woman who doesn't get to speak. Um, and so to be able to do that on screen, that's one thing. And then there's just the sort of formal innovations you see. I mean, something like Sarah Ganter's Russian Troll Farm, you know, was, which was originally meant for stage. I get it. But I will bet when it comes back to the stage again, it's a fantastic play. The things they learned by having to deal with online and, and the sort of opportunities that gave them in terms of moving between different environments is something that we're going to see. Royal Shakespeare Company just yesterday announced that they're going to do a Midsummer Night Stream that's going to use gaming technology um, and, uh, and, and a virtually created environment so that actors can interact with an audience moving through it in real time. I mean, that's cool and exciting. And I think while some of this mm -hmm. stuff, I don't ever want to see a Zoom reading again when this is over. Um, I'm sure that you, none of you ever want to have to deal with a green screen again, but there are other things here 
that we will be able to use that will make theater different and better in ways I don't even know how to figure out yet. Yeah, there's something to be said for being shaken out of um, our usual way of doing business. It's it's scary and it's disruptive, and I'm not entirely sure any of us would choose it voluntarily. <laughs> um, but when everything's been kind of tossed up into the air, it there is an opportunity there. There is an opportunity to re-examine how we do things, why we do things, for whom and with whom we do things. Um, and that's where innovation really comes. And so, uh, you know, I don't think that's not just silver, silver lining wishfulness. I think that's, that's really true. We are, the field will be changed permanently because of what this last year has brought us and hopefully in mostly good ways, uh, long-term, but you know, short-term, you know, to get onto a sort of another, where do we go from here topic, you know, thinking more in the terms of months than hopefully I'll knock wood right here than years. Um, what this means for safety and for the ways in which we create our work and the ways in which we interact with our audience. Uh, you know, we are in the, the thick of working on safety plans right now here at Forward with Actors' Equity and the other unions um, to try to move back into being able to at least create theater in person on a, on a stage um, to be filmed and shared because we're still, you know, I think uh, a bit away from having live audience safely. But um, all of these new protocols that really, that do put restrictions on how we how we create our art and how do we, um, how long do we think those are going to be a part of our, our life? How long do we think that our, we're going to be creating our work kind of with one hand tied behind our backs, um, before we get back to, I, I hesitate to call it normal because we know it will be a changed normal, but but creating theater where we don't have to filter every choice through, um, is someone going to breathe on somebody else right now? And that really is kind of the biggest concern as we, as we think about it right now. Um, and that's maybe not a question for us to answer. That's for the epidemiologists. <laughs> but well, I do think people are going to wear masks. I think masks are here to stay. And I think as, as often as we say, when the theaters are open or when we can go to movies or restaurants, people are going to plow in. I, I think there's going to be a period of time where um, there is still some trepidation and, and it will feel really strange to be around a whole bunch of people. Um, so I think those, the, the masks, the, um, there will, there might always be plexiglass at grocery stores. Um, that, you know, I think there are things that definitely that safety, the safety protocols are here to stay. Mm. Yeah, you know, the Broadway, now this is Broadway, so you're dealing with a huge tourist population and, and the, all the difficulties of travel. And you're also dealing with very, very big, very old houses where people are crammed together. But the Broadway League is saying they don't think that they will return to pre-pandemic levels till 2025. Um, I mean, I think regions are going to, it's going to happen a lot sooner than that. But Julie, I think you're right. I think it's going to change acting. I mean, I already saw it in... Um, the really fabulous um, Milwaukee rep production of Christmas, uh, Jacob Marley's Christmas Carol with Lee Ernst. Now, Lee Ernst is a gifted, gifted physical actor, and he needed to be even if he wasn't in this production, because through most of rehearsal, he was masked. So we get so used to reading people through their faces. And when you can't do that, and when it changes even the contours of a rehearsal process, it requires actors to draw on different skill sets um, in terms of the kinds of things they're going to convey and how they're going to convey them. Again, this is potentially a glass half full thing. I mean, to think ourselves more into our bodies in terms of how we interact with other people on stage in ways that we might be, you know, not that those muscles don't get exercised all the time, but they'll be drawn on even more heavily now. Maybe that leads to new discoveries for individual actors in their craft. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think to your to both of your points, um, it is going to take a while 
for us to be back to, to fuller houses. I'm, I'm with you, Mike, the regional theaters, it's not going to take as long as Broadway. Our economic model is just different. Um, it just is. So I, I, I don't think it's going to take us again. I, I think I'm going to knock Lloyd a lot during this uh, podcast. Um, I don't think it's, we're talking 2025, but I mean, again, we're in the thick of our budget process for the 21, 22 season right now, Julie and I, and, and discussing ticket sales projections and all of that. And we, you know, we, we are anticipating it's going to take a couple of years at least to get back to, you know, we pretty frequently had full, full houses at forward theater pre pandemic. And, um, in a combination of, I think, I think that, that, you know, governmental restrictions may still be somewhat in effect, this fall, maybe not, but um, capacity restrictions with there may be external forces that limit the capacity in the theater for a little while yet. But even when that's not an issue, I just think it's going to take a while for for everybody who used to come to the theater to get back into that habit, to feel safe about it, to remember it's something that they like and enjoy doing. Um, I think that's going to take a while, but I, I do also think that when we get there, it's going to be, um, I think we're going to get a bit of a renaissance. I think, I think that the audience's demand for live experience is going to crest at a peak higher than we've maybe seen in my lifetime. Um, and I think that the, the creativity, um, that we're going to see from theater artists who are so ecstatic to be back creating, uh, live theater for live audiences is going to be um, pretty amazing as well. I was just chatting with a friend in London yesterday that said Alan Akeborn has already written eight plays since the beginning. <laughs> of that. Now, you know, that's not much more than Alan Akeborn writes normally in nine months, but that's pretty, you know, I think there's going to be an explosion. I also think the way in which we interact with each other as theater companies and with the community is going to change. This is another, this isn't the glass half full. This is a glass four fifths full. I'm very excited by things <laughs> like Cal Shakes just announced a couple of days ago, their new season. They're only going to do one play in their outdoor space this year. It's a winner's tale. They will run it for much longer than they normally run a play. And what they've done instead of trying to do more plays is they've invited in three other companies uh, in the Bay Area that are going to do work. I think it's two dance companies and I can't remember what the third, and, and an opera company. Um, and I think you're going to see more things like that as theater is going to be defined in a way that involves more collaborations and not just collaborations with other artistic groups. I think there will be more collaboration with the community. I think there will be more community events and more community outreach. We've already seen theater moving in this direction, but I think it's going to absolutely accelerate. There will be more interactions like the one that Forward has with the Follett High School in Madison, where we do collaborations with them, that kind of thing. And what we think a theater company's mission is, are, are have been evolving. I mean, the work's always going to be super important, but the nature of what we are on this earth to do as a theater company, we all talk a good game about empathy and outreach and making better people and all of that. We're going to be put to the task of proving that. And we'll want to, I think, in terms of how we interact with those with whom we live and who we hope to make this stuff we do seem relevant. Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're right, Mike. And, and especially to your point that th these are not new ideas and these are not new initiatives, certainly on our end here at forward, you know, most of what you just described is stuff that went, um, uh, far preceded the, the impact of COVID, but there's wind in our sails. There's wind in our sails. That's been created by, um, a new focus on community, a new focus on taking care of our, our, our friends and neighbors. Um, you know, the fact that, that it's harder to do a big Broadway tour right now, it's easier to put together a local production, um, you know, and, and all the other iterations within the different art forms. I think that the, the renewed importance of local art that is of, by, and for its community um, is intensified by what we've gone through, what we are still going through with, with the pandemic. Um, so that's, that's exciting. It's, again, it's, it's not new ideas, it's new energy supporting us as we pursue those ideas. And that actually brings me to one more topic that I think we, we have to talk about as we're looking at what comes next. And that is the renewed focus within our industry as a whole on anti-racism and, and equity issues. Uh, really spurred by 
the 2020 protests and conversations after the murder of George Floyd spurred by the efforts of the artists who put together the We See You White American Theater Manifesto and Demands document. Um, And again, yes, there are, of course, there are companies out there as there are individuals out there who really are coming to this work brand new in the wake of, of 2020. But for most of us, this is stuff that we have been thinking about and working on and um, addressing for years. And we have more wind in our sails. Now the, the changing national conversation, the changing focus, um, provides more support and opportunity to maybe make, um, greater strides in, in those efforts. So, I mean, what do you think we might see in that, um, in that realm over the next couple of months or years? Well, for one thing, and we've talked about this on the podcast, um, and I know it's near and dear to all of our hearts, some of the best playwriting, a lot of the best playwriting that's being done right now is by BIPOC artists um, or by non-binary and, and women uh, artists. And, and yet we're still in a situation, not just in Wisconsin, but nationally, we're under 50%, well under 50% um, of the work that we see is by those, those groups, which is nuts. Um, and so the wind in the sails thing in part will be allowing a lot of theater makers who I think have wanted to quote unquote, do the right thing and put on more of this work that is challenging perhaps for an audience um, or pushes them in different ways. And there's now wind in, in those theater makers sales to be able to put those plays on and to have a sort of, a, a, we're in a different place as a country in terms of receptiveness and, and, and willingness to engage with um, those things. And that to me is the most exciting um, uh, part, part of this. There's just so many plays I'm excited to see um, and that we just haven't really seen outside of Chicago or New York or LA that we're going to be seen in places like, um, like Wisconsin, more things like the exit strategy that forward did in introducing Wisconsin to a great playwright like Guy Coulter, who, you know, is going to be among the many, many BIPOC playwrights, uh, right here in the Midwest that are going to be getting more exposure moving forward. Yeah. Um, it was, it was just- I, I won't say serendipitous, but it was the the timing worked that we were um, at a theaters were at a lull at the time when they were challenged with this. We see you white American theater and had the capacity to take that in at least, you know, and, and I know it wasn't just forward. I know all around the country staff members poured through that document. Um, we took it to our advisory company and our board. And there were specific demands that um, can be implemented right now. It, it's changed the argument from um, we should all be better to here are the things to make us better. And um, how wonderful that we can go into the next season, the next, the next phase, phase of this, of this time. Um, with renewed capacity to think about this and and specific directives. Um, I think about specifically, um, we do talkbacks after every show. That was a specific demand to think about who's who's doing the talkback, who's hearing the talkback, and how, how do you make that, um, uh, the, the equality of that stronger and the protection of the um, the BIPOC actor in an all white audience. What does that look like? I, I mean, we've always talked about that. We've always tried really hard to, um, to achieve that. And I look forward now to all of us, all theater companies working towards that goal. You know, I, I think, um, uh, responding and amplifying that, Julie, and this is, you know, the little dramaturg in me, of course, is going to love what I'm about to say. So it's it's biased, folks. Warning. Um, I think you're going to see way, way more educational programming um, built in around what's what's going on. You're seeing it already. I mean, there's so much I can't keep up with it online that theater companies are doing in terms of talks like those that Jen had all summer with different um, theater makers in in Madison. Um, things like New York Theater Workshop doing a whole you know forum open forum session that they invited people on via Zoom 
to talk about the election in, in, in relation to the Roman Republic in the in the months leading up to um, to, to the election. Um, you know, court theaters, educational seminars on Lorraine Hansberry, what Milwaukee Rep is doing this month uh, for Black History Month, where they're having a forum every Monday night. The Milwaukee Rep's Rep divides um, stuff, which is sort of having conversations around things like lead poisoning in Milwaukee, about the reentry of former, formerly incarcerated persons into the community. All of that's going to be seen as part and parcel of what a theater company needs to do. And in addition, Here's the dramaturgical part in terms of introducing some of these new plays and playwrights. There's going to be way more work so that they can be justly and fairly um, presented to a community that may not be familiar with them and, and, and where the community can engage in things like talkbacks and be challenged in, in ways that that really make the play you know, sing um, for that community. And I think that's all to the good. It's again, all part of theater's expanded understanding of itself. Yeah. If I had to distill uh, the the single biggest thing that I think might come out of um, the efforts made by companies across the country uh, since last summer, and especially since the publication of We See White American Theater, I think the biggest change is a level of accountability and being held to do more than talk, yes. which I think is actually a really, really positive development because you guys know I one of my biggest pet, you know, um, annoyances is just talking about things and talking about it and talking about it and not ever converting that to action. And, um, that seems to be kind of the primary directive of, of what we're being asked to do is stop just talking about it, do your work, show us how you're changing. And if you don't, you're going to get called out for it. And yes, we all know examples of, um, how uh, that can can go wrong, but overall, I I do think that it's going to be a positive development. It's gonna it's gonna hold us all to better live our ideals, live our mission, serve our communities, and sometimes that's that's the only way that that important steps get taken. So I, I it will be a bumpy road. There will be some painful growth for sure. There there often is, but I think real growth and and that's. That's really exciting. Agreed. We've been going for a while here, friends. I think this uh, might we, be a good it, it time. It seems like we're hopeful for the future. There's lots yeah. of good things that are coming. That's yeah. always <laughs> where I like to end a conversation or a play. So I think we will say that is all for this episode of Theater Forward, a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest, and America. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jen Uphoff Gray. I'm Julie Swenson. I'm Mike Fisher. Our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden. And I'm going to stop my normal thing right now and say, Scott Hayden has produced all 50 of these <laughs> podcasts, has done all kinds of other amazing stuff, producing our season and making it possible. He is an awesome human. And he is the reason why we are all talking to you today. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And, and courtesy of Scott, having set all this up, you can follow us on Facebook um, or Twitter. Um, it's Theater Forward, theater as always, spelled with an E-R. Uh, and if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you might tune in. And be sure to leave a review or send us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. And we are so grateful to have you listening. We will be back soon for another Theater Forward conversation.